And so if you would take your Bible and open it to Philippians chapter 4 this morning. Philippians chapter 4. And we're going to get into our message uh, for today. This is the, the continuation of what we dealt with last week. As we looked at uh, Philippians chapter 4 verses 1 through 3. And last week I introduced you and... Uh, you did good, Jim. You bypassed that whole song real quick. Thank you. You're good. You're a good guy for many reasons, right, Nancy? Right. Right, for sure, definitely. Uh, but last week I introduced you to uh, a, a situation that was going on at the Church of Philippi. Two ladies, Yodia and Syntyche, who uh, were the were the source of a conflict that was happening in this church all throughout the book. Paul had been focusing his efforts, focusing everything that he said in this book about joy as the overriding theme, but there was disunity that was happening in the church of Philippi that was destroying their joy, or at least hindering their joy, because all the things that they had to rejoice in, they had this undercurrent that was going on that was limiting that. And so Paul, as he's dealt with these things in, in, in general terms throughout the rest of the book, he begins to to directly deal with with these two women. So let's look at the passage here to begin with. Philippians 4, verses 1 through 3. It says, Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I am poor Yodia and I am poor Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companions, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Now Paul felt that this issue, because the Holy Spirit is instructed him to, felt that this issue was significant enough that he would take part of God's eternal word and direct it at this issue. Paul didn't deal with every issue or every person that he faced. He didn't confront every issue. For example, at the beginning of the book... <coughs> Paul talks about some individuals who were preaching Christ for the, for the wrong motivation. The reason that they were preaching Christ at that point was to stick it to Paul. Because where was Paul when he was writing this book? In prison. Guess what he couldn't do freely while he's in prison? He couldn't preach. Now, he preached to the people that were there in prison, but he had his access was very limited. So these people, they were preaching Christ out there just as... Oh, you can't do what, what I get to do out here. <laughs> well, I know how to evil that did. But anyway. But Paul didn't confront those people except to indirectly point out their motivation. Why not? Why did he choose to confront Yodi and Syndicate and not confront these others? Well, part of the reason has to deal with that you don't deal with every single issue. You don't confront every single person. That's part of the reason why I do not talk about from the pulpit every current event that is happening in our society. But if there is a current event that fits with the passage that we're talking about that morning, then I will deal with it because I feel like if that the passage of what's going on in society fit well together, then there must be a reason that God brought us to that passage at the time. Fact is, I could fill up our time here with every ludicrous news story that I read throughout the week. I imagine you read a, a, a good fair number of, of stories and things that are going on. They're like, man, what, what in the world is that happening? Why is that going on? So instead, I choose to focus our time here. Because this is what can get your heart and mind right. And if your heart and mind is in the right place, then you will have the resources that you need to be able to properly deal with whatever stories, whatever situations it is that you face throughout the week out there in the world. Still, we're left with a question. How do you determine if it's worth it to confront a person or an issue? Establishing blanket criteria that applies to every situation is very difficult. I think we'd all agree that confronting every situation and every person every time is foolish, unproductive, and can actually be manipulative. I mean, your parents at some um, somewhere along the way told you these words: "Choose your battles." I think that's very advice. I would add something to that, though. I would say, choose the reasoning for your battles. 
See, there was only one proper reason to confront somebody about an issue. You know what that reason is? Because you love them. Because you love them. You confront because you love someone. But there are some things that you put up with because you love someone. Jim, go ahead and go to that next slide there for me, please. Said these words, love covers a multitude of sins. There are times that when somebody does something that you don't deal with that particular issue because you, you just let love cause you to stay over that issue. It's not worthy of dealing with. It's not worthy of confronting. However, on those issues that might bring harm to the person or that might bring harm to the group, if those issues are left unchecked, you deal with those issues. In fact, it is the most loving thing that you can do for the individual as well as the group to deal with those issues because you love them and you don't want harm to come into their lives. Now, if you want further, further ideas or parameters for when you confront somebody, I would suggest that what you do is you would do a Bible study on Jesus and how he confronted people. Because Jesus, anybody who thinks that Jesus was a mamby-pamby kind of person that just went along with the flow, <laughs> doesn't know Jesus too well. He confronted on a regular basis, but he did not do so the same way every single time. He adjusted his, his confrontation methods according to the person and the situation. Sometimes he was very, Jesus got violent. Mm -hmm. Think about the money changers at the temple. But there were other times that Jesus was very gentle, like the woman at the well. Jesus confronted her on the fact that she was living with somebody who she was not married to, but he was not in her face. He was very gentle and very kind in the way that he confronted. He adjusted his confrontation according to the situation and the person. Here's the best advice I can give to you on when and who and how to confront. Do what Jesus did. He listened to the Holy Spirit directing him in those parameters of when and who and how. And it was God's Spirit that prompted Paul here in Philippians chapter 4 to confront Yodia and Syntyche. The reason is obvious. Their behavior, and more importantly, the attitude behind their behavior was creating a situation in that church where there was disunity that was happening and it was threatening to destroy the joy of the church. It was threatening to destroy the existence of the church. You may debate about when it is right to confront, but what you cannot debate about if you're going to be biblical is this. There was only one proper motivation for confrontation and it is not your personal preference. It's love. And that's where we started last week. When dealing with conflict, go on, there you go again. When dealing with conflict, be loving. I mentioned this verse through last week, Philippians 4 1. Therefore, my what? Beloved and long for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord. What? Beloved. Beloved. Confrontation is usually painful. I am a conflict avoider. And God made me a pastor. Go figure. Conflict is painful. It hurts to confront people that you love. However, if you truly love people, then you've got to confront them on those things that are not right in their lives. Folks, I told you last week, and we tell you again, because there's some people here that weren't here last week, I love you. And so whenever, as we're sitting in Sunday school, that I step on your toes, know that one is because God has already stepped on my toes. <laughs> Understand that? Okay. But two, I, I, I don't want you to walk into dangerous, hurtful territory. And if the only way to prevent that is for your feet to hurt, then it's worth it. Okay? When you, conf when you confront somebody, do so in a loving kind of way. Secondly, when dealing with conflict, be direct. He says, I implore Yodia and I implore Sentiki. To make sure that the message hit home, and, and that, as was said in Sunday school, it doesn't just don't pass over your head and say, wow, that was a good message for such and such. Paul used names. He was very direct. The, there was no way for these women to, to, to excuse him saying, well, he was talking about the other person. 
No, he used names. These two women were the source of conflict in the church, and they needed to deal with it. So Paul spoke his message to them directly. If you want to resolve conflict, you can't beat around the bush. The most efficient, most effective way is to talk to that person directly, whether it be a private matter, hopefully, you know, if it's a private matter, you deal with it privately. If it's a public matter, you have permission to deal with it publicly, but you don't necessarily have to. But in, in as, as small an environment as possible, deal with those things directly. Be careful, though, in that being direct, you do so in the right context. Have you, ever, have you ever, as you're talking to another person, maybe about something that, you know, might be a little bit of disagreement, maybe a little confrontational, they react a certain way that cause you to say, whoa, where did that come from? Because that person, as, as you perhaps you're talking a very low-key disagreement, very, very low-key type of situation, not that big a deal, and all of a sudden they just, whoa, their blood pressure goes up, and they, you know, they get all miffed and everything, and they get all angry, and like, What's going on? It might not have to do with what you're discussing with them. It might have to do with the environment where you're discussing it. One of the uh, ways that I have uh, sought over the years to, to supplement my family's income was as the head of an after-school program at a school. And one of my responsibilities was to talk to anybody that had an overdue bill and see about getting that resolved. That's always fun. <laughs> That can be very tricky. One day as I was there, parents were starting to line up to pick up their kids and everything, and I did not know most of the people there. It was not a school where I taught. It was just a school where I worked at a school program. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, a gentleman walked in whom I recognized, and I knew that he had an overdue bill. And so I walked up to him and told him about his overdue, overdue bill. He was not happy. Now, I, I, I had made a mistake, and he immediately told me my mistake, and, I, and I, when I realized it, I said, oh, I apologize profusely and everything. It was not the bill that was an error. It was me that was an error. You know why? Because I confronted a man about an overdue bill in front of other people. I messed up. Last week, we sang a song, They Will Know You're Christians by Your Love. Um, no, that's not you, Jim, that's me. Uh, <laughs> let me say for you the words that we sang. We will work with each other. We will work side by side. We will work with each other. We will work side by side. And we'll guard each man's dignity and save each man's pride. Now, I know that there's a bad pride, but there's also a Good pride. Can we, can we, is that true? There's, there's dignity. And what I failed to do with that man, I, I had no relationship with that man. I barely even knew his name. But I have a responsibility to love him. And I failed to do that. I was direct, but I was not loving. And both are necessary. Thirdly, whenever we deal with conflict, we need to be focused. Paul says to these women, Philippians 4, verses 2 and 3, be of the same mind in the Lord, and then he mentions the gospel. Now, whenever two people are fighting with each other, whenever it's a confrontation that's going on, focus is not usually a problem. They are very focused. Track is you can't get them to focus on anything except the argument that they're dealing with at that time. They are laser focused on one thing. Win. Destroy. Prove that you are right. Stand your ground. Give no way for anybody else to make their way into whatever your situation is. When you are defending yourself, you are very focused on whatever it is that is going on that time. You are focused on what you want to happen, the argument, winning that. But you are not focused on why you're arguing to begin with. Now, I'm not talking about the issue. I'm talking about the relationship. You're not focused on what it is you're trying to actually accomplish in the midst of that conflict and that confrontation. In the heat of conflict, especially when you are losing or if your objective is to destroy the other person, the temptation is to take the nuclear option. 
rather than using precision-guided cruise missiles to destroy a specific target, you drop every bomb you have, no matter the collateral damage that it might produce. You might know this terminology by this, the kitchen sink mentality. You know how an argument goes, right? You're, you're, there's one particular issue that you're, that you're dealing with or that prompted this heated discussion, but in the midst of the argument, because you want to win the argument, you bring in all these things. Well, what about last year and 10 years ago? Well, what about this? What about that? And you bring everything into the argument except the focused issue that you're supposed to be dealing with. There's a sign that becomes very apparent whenever somebody is using the kitchen sink mentality. You know what that sign is? They start using the words always and never. I can tell you this. It is almost always the case that people will pay attention when you use the words always and never. It will never go unnoticed. Fact is that always and never rarely apply in any situation. The only time they are appropriate in a conflict situation is when, we, when you use them to affirm your love for the person that you are having an argument with. I challenge you. As you are arguing with somebody, I know you guys are all very sedate individuals and you never argue with anybody, right? Yeah, whatever, okay? I challenge you, whenever you are arguing with another person, as you get passionate and defensive and all those kind of things, I challenge you with the same level of passion that you are arguing with to say these words. I will always love you and I will never leave your side regardless of the outcome of this disagreement that we're having right now. And then watch to see what happens in the demeanor of the person that you are arguing with. Do you think that might steal a little bit of heat? out of the argument. If we got just as focused and just as passionate in our love for the other individual as we are in defending our case, hmm, maybe not as many children would wind up in Sally's Children's Home Society. Maybe more marriages would survive and thrive. See, if your goal is to win the argument, then use the kitchen sink mentality. Use everything you've got. But if your goal is for your relationship to get to a new level of intimacy and love, then do what is necessary, even if it means you not getting your way, to make sure that it becomes very evident that the relationship is far more important to you than you win. Give laser focus to your disagreement. Do not veer off on other issues. Work on resolving one at a time. A kitchen sink mentality might win the argument for you, but at the same time, it could very well destroy the relationship, which is more important to you. Now, churches, too, can have a kitchen sink mentality. They can say things like this. Let us do everything that we can think of, everything that every other church around us is doing, and everything that we've done in the past, we want to look busy. Is it our goal to look busy? Is that what our mission statement is? We look busy. Is that what our mission statement is? No. Danville Community Baptist Church has a mission. And I'm not just talking about what our actual mission statement is. I'm talking about our biblical mission. If something fits into that mission, we might do it if we have the resources, the people, the time, the energy, the finances to be able to do it. But if it does not fit into our mission, should we do it? If it does not fit into our mission, should we do it? No. No. That's not what God has called us to do. Our laser-focused mission is the same one that Jesus had. Go to that next slide for me if you would, Jim. See, the phrase that Paul used here in Philippians 4, 2 is similar to the one that, that he used earlier in the book, in Philippians 2, verse 5. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. After saying that, Paul proceeded to talk about everything that Jesus had said and done to provide something for us. You know what he provided for us? Salvation. Why? 
with Jesus here. Luke 19, 10. He said, this is Jesus' words, not anybody else's, this is Jesus' words. He said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. As individuals and as a church, we share Jesus' mission. When we get blurry on why we're here, that is when problems start to multiply. Todd and Corey were uh, very gracious in that they invited me to come along with them going down the river yesterday, and we had a great time together, and and uh, hadn't been in a canoe since Sam and I sat in a canoe together uh, just a few years ago, well, quite a few years ago, I guess now. But um, as we're going down the river, I'm at the front of the canoe just sitting there, you know, coasting along, Todd doing all the work in the back of the canoe and everything. <laughs> But uh, he and Corey brought, brought along some fishing reels, and they, you know, they're tossing them out there. So you might have seen the pictures on Facebook and everything of the, of the fishes that they caught. We didn't eat any fish. You know, they caught them, threw them back, all kind of stuff and everything. Uh, there, our, our, what we went to do yesterday was to go down the river. They were just, you know, having a little bit of fun fishing as we went. But there are other times that I imagine that either one of them or some of you, you're, you were there to fish. And fishing requires focus. I read a story um, in a book by Max Lucado. Some of you know that name. And he talked about a, a fishing trip that lost its focus. And because of that, the trip went horribly wrong. The dad and the two boys that were with him woke up on the first morning of their fishing trip. And as they peeked out the, the door of the tent, it was raining. It was supposed to be a several day trip, and each day pro grew progressively worse in the weather. Cold, rain, it was just nasty. Well, the first day they figured, hey, we brought some other things just in case, you know, that we can do in the tent. And so they did those other things in the tent, but those things that they could do in the tent lost their appeal very quickly because they'd come to do what? Yeah. To fish. As the days progressed along, that tent began to stink. Not just because of the waterlogged socks, but because of the sour attitudes. See, they had spent so much time together not being able to do what they were designed to do, what they were there to do. They were there to fish, and they couldn't fish. No one complained much when Dad finally said, let's pack up and go home. That's what they did. And on that fishing trip, they learned something. Now, about fishing... But about people. And what they learn applies to us. When those who are called to fish don't fish, what do they do? They fight. Instead of casting nets, they cast stones. Instead of extending helping hands, they point accusing fingers. Instead of being fishers of the lost, they become critics of the saved. Rather than helping the hurting, they hurt the helpless. Jesus said to those he met beside the sea, I will make you fishers of men. I learned something a long time ago. Somebody counseled me with this. They said, keep the main thing, the main thing. Because when you forget why you're there, that's when everything starts to go wrong. When you're focused on, on your mission, when you're focused on what it is that you're supposed to be doing, then things can can progress in the way they need to need to go. Whenever we as a church lose our focus, we lose our effectiveness. We are here to win people to Jesus and then help them become like Jesus. We do that through the gospel. That is our focus. Some of you like fighting. Great. <laughs> I just want to switch your foe from the person you're fighting to the real enemy that you have. Because he is a much bigger challenge and he is very skilled and I need your fighting skills to be able to fight against that foe. Do you know that evangelism, sharing our faith with other people is spiritual warfare? We, we have an enemy and he's not the person that's sitting next to you or in another pew or your neighbor or whoever that's might be. Our enemy is Satan. And he wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy this church. 
Folks, the most confrontational thing there is, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. At the same time, the gospel is offensive. Think about it. You're telling someone they're a sinner and they're on their way to hell. That's pretty offensive. It's offensive and yet it's gracious. Because you get to tell them that even though that is their, their natural status, that God loves them and that Jesus died for them and that he wants a relationship with them. If you like being confrontational, then let me introduce you to evangelism. Mm -hmm. Folks, I'm asking you to join me in a war for people. How can you join me in a war for people if you are at war with people? Your spouse, your family, your children, your boss, your neighbor, or people in this church. When dealing with conflict, be loving, be direct, and be focused. Number four, when dealing with conflict, be humble. Paul says this, be of the same mind in the Lord, and I urge you also, true companion, help these women. Paul told these women to be of the same mind in the Lord. To be of the same mind doesn't mean necessarily to come to the same conclusion. It means to think the same way. It means to have the same attitude. Well, what attitude am I supposed to have? The attitude of Jesus Christ. Several weeks ago, as we were in Philippians chapter 2, way back when, we looked at some other verses there. It says this, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, that's humility, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for their own interests, but also for the interests of others. That's unselfishness. Humility and unselfishness. That is the mind of Christ. Paul was not suggesting that we do the same actions that Jesus did when he said, let this mind be in you. He's not saying that you should go to the cross like Jesus did, literally. But he was saying that we, we should do the same thing that Jesus did figuratively, dying to ourselves. Having an attitude like Jesus had, an attitude of humility, self-sacrifice. And a willingness to give ourselves for other people. Folks, conflicts do not just happen because you disagree with another person. Conflicts happen because you're not willing to listen to the other person. And not willing to understand why it is that they're coming up with whatever it is they're coming up. Most of us don't listen when we're in the middle of conflict. Oh yeah, oh, we listen. We listen to be able to gain ammunition for the next round. But we don't listen to understand. At that point, when we're in the middle of conflict, it may be necessary for an outsider to step in and bring two warring groups together. And that is what Paul suggested could be helpful to these two women. Jim, if you go on that next one, if you would, please. And he's, he goes back to this, be of the same mind. I urge you, true companion, help these women. They needed somebody on the outside. Here it says true companion. In your Bible it might say yoke fellow, mediator, somebody to be a go-between between between these two women and help them see things from, from the other perspective. For that to work, in order for someone to come into the middle of an argument or middle of a, a conflict between them, you know what was going to be required from Yodi and Syntyche? Listen. They had to be willing to listen to somebody on the outside to help them be able to resolve their disagreement. And listening is what I need from you this morning. I'm running a risk this morning. I want to mention some things here that potentially could make every person in this place mad at me today by the subjects that I'm getting ready to address. I told you last week that whenever you confront somebody, you take a risk. Well, sometimes that's necessary. If you do not listen to my whole argument, you will likely misunderstand and get offended. I do not want that. So please listen. Go ahead, Jim. I grew up in Atlanta. You know that. Uh, and being that I was from Atlanta, uh, sports, a lot of sports going on there. Atlanta Braves. Any Braves fans in here? No Braves fans. Okay. All right. Whatever. Uh, my grandmother was an ardent fan of the Atlanta Braves baseball team. I, I, I was not a big sports person, but I'd go to a game from now, from time to time. This is Chief Nakahoma. That was his name, Chief Nakahoma. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, you'll get it later anyway. All right. And he would, you know, he'd be in that, and, and Tammy got it. That's good. Are you, uh, I'm laughing over there. Okay. And he would have his, his teepee there, and you know, he'd come out and do his old dance and all kind of stuff and everything. Some of you may be aware of the tomahawk, that tomahawk top. Yeah, 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 I hear it. Yeah, that one back there for sure. All those kinds of things and everything. Um, there are people that are very upset about the Atlanta Braves culture. Even the name of the team is taken from Indian culture. You see the signs. No chop zone, racist, mascot must go. There are people that, that think that Native Americans are offended by the Braves and well as other teams using this culture in order to be able to support their culture. So I've got a question. Are Native Americans offended by, by the Atlanta Braves culture? Only if the Braves are losing. <laughs> you know how you know whether or not they're offended? Ask them. Starting this fall, the University of Pennsylvania has decided something to change how it refers to its students. You know how students are usually referred to, freshmen, sophomores, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Well, they've decided to start referring to their students as first year, second year, and so forth and so on. You know why? Because freshmen has the word men. In it. <laughs> and juniors and seniors, that's a male context. You know, you don't th talk about that with ladies, juniors and seniors. You talk about that with men. And so they figure that there must be some women who are offended by those terms. And so we'll do the woke thing and we will change how we refer in these situations. To me, that sounds rather sophomoric. You know what the term sophomore means? <laughs> it means wise fool. <laughs> Some people who, are, who think they're very wise, in my opinion, are wasting their time on some very unimportant matters. Now, we have others arguing about, uh, oh, uh, but before I leave that, I thought about something, how we could change this. I thought about a better solution. Let's do this. Instead of calling them fresh men, let's call them fresh women. That might create some other problems, and so I'm not so sure that that would be a great solution. <laughs> but we've also got some people arguing about what pronoun to use for people. <laughs> hmm. They would have a field day with Paul, because I don't know if you notice in this passage, but as he's talking to this whole group of people, he refers to them as brethren. Brethren is a male term, even though the, the primary audience that Paul wanted to listen to him was two women. Okay, I wonder if Yodi and Cindy could get offended by that. Can't you hear them saying, well, excuse me? How dare you refer to me with that terminology? I'm from the Deep South. When I refer to a group of people that has men and women in it, I say, hey, guys. Should I change that to be, hey guys and hey gals? Is anybody offended by that? I don't know. But as we go along, we fight over silly stuff sometimes. However, I have to be humble enough to recognize that what I might consider to be insignificant might be a weighty matter to someone else. A favorite attraction in Atlanta is a place called Stone Mountain Park. Uh, it gets its name from this giant granite outcropping there, and many, uh, most of my uh, teen years, the memory, the good memories that I have from that from that time frame, a lot of them revolve around time spent at this park. You can see that there's a carving there in that. Jim, uh, Jim going to bring up the next one there, so you can see it a little bit better what it is. It is a carving of Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, and Jefferson Davis, the uh, three leaders of the Confederacy. And uh, the, the carving itself is 190 feet wide and 90 feet tall. There was actually a wedding that happened on the top of that hat. How they got there, I don't know. It was about a wedding party of about nine people that was there on top of that hat there. It's a beautiful carving. But for some people, they would just assume that it was dynamited off the face of that rock and that it was just a bunch of rubble at the base of that mountain. 
you know that in recent days that many Civil War monuments um, have come down. People on either side of the argument get very heated with each other. They, on one side of the argument, they will say, well, they're a part of history. We should leave them alone. They're part of history. People on the other side of the argument say, well, that is a monument to an oppressive government. Sometime in the past, yes, but a monument to an oppressive government. Before you, uh, you probably already have your mind made up on what direction to go and everything, but before you state what your opinion is, let me show you another picture here. Do you know what this picture is? Saddam Hussein. His head is missing, but when the forces of the coalition came into uh, Iraq and toppled the government of Saddam Hussein, they also were, were part of the process of toppling the statue and statues, really, that were they put there in order to be able to lift him up by him and by his forces and such. So let me ask you a question. What would you say to the Iraqi people? Would you say, you made a mistake in taking down that statue? You should have left it there in order to be a reminder that if you're not vigilant, then these things can come back again. People might be offended by these things that I mentioned, or they might be okay with it. To assume one way or the other is foolish, and especially if you've got somebody in a particular that falls into a particular category, and you assume that because they fall into that category, then their opinion is the opinion of all the other people that are in that category is, well, offensive. Because you can't assume that just because a person is in any particular category that they believe the same way everybody else in that category does. How do you find out if a person is offended? You ask them. You listen. Your asking shows humility and their willingness to listen for that other person even though you might be differ very much from them in how they come down on a particular issue. Even after you listen to them and, and your opinion and your actions don't change, the very fact that you were willing to take the time to listen and understand shows humility. You might still believe the same way. You might still act the same way. So you need to listen and humbly ask yourself, why do they believe the way they believe? Now, I'm not suggesting a particular course of action. I'm not suggesting to you what should or should not happen with Civil War memorials or with the Atlanta Braves or with what used to be the Washington Redskins. I'm not suggesting a particular action. What, except for this course, I'm asking you to listen. To whatever person it is that you have something to disagree with, man, that you need to listen to them well enough to be able to understand that the, how, why they're coming at that particular issue from that side so that you can find some way to be able to come together on that particular issue. Now, I would not suggest that you go around to every person timidly ask, if I do this, will you be offended? I'm not going to do that, folks. I'm not going to act ba based on whether or not somebody else is going to be offended by that, that issue or that deal or that stance. However, if I offend one of you or if I offend another person and it becomes obvious that offense has happened, then I would ask of you that you would come to me or that I would go to you if I'm clear that an offense has happened and let's sit down for some coffee or if coffee offends you, we'll do tea. You, you know. <laughs> let's sit down together and let's talk it out. That's what mature people do. They listen. They talk. Folks, Someone's going to be offended no matter what you do. Can I get an amen? amen? But that doesn't excuse me listening to their perspective and showing humility to be able to show them that a lot of them. We may continue to disagree, but if I make it gospel to them, remember that's our focus? If I make it the gospel to them, I need to show them that I love them. Now, when it comes to those issues that the Bible directly addresses, I know what course of action I'm going to take. Paul told this church and other churches, go on to the next slide, would Jim? Uh, I guess go on to the next one. There we go. 
He says, stand fast in the Lord. You know what, folks? This is what I want us to do as a church, and this is what I commit to do. When it comes to preference and opinion, we will give way when it is appropriate to do so, and when giving way helps to build healthy relationships. But when it comes to doctrine, what the Bible clearly teaches, I don't care what offends you. I'll still listen to you, but I'm not going to change my mind. Because if the Bible clearly teaches something, I'm going to stand my ground on that particular issue as much as I possibly can. As best I understand Scripture, as best I've studied through something, I'm going to come to conviction on those things. Now, we could mention many areas that the Bible talks about, many things that it deals with, but there's only one area that this particular passage deals with, and it is this one. Paul said that these women, Yodi and Syntyche, had helped him in the ministry. And one of the things that is, Tim and I are heading to uh, the Southern Mass Convention next week. And there's an issue that's brewing in the Southern Mass Convention. It's been brewing for a long time, but it's coming to a head. And that is this issue, women in ministry. What role do women play in ministry? The largest church in the Southern, Southern Mass Convention, the uh, Saddleback Church in California, recently ordained three women to become pastors of churches. And so I, it's very, becoming pretty clear that that's going to be one of the issues that is going to be dealt with um, at the Southern Mass Convention. So don't answer this question. Don't answer this question, okay? Was Saddleback Church correct in ordaining these women as pastors? Before I answer that question, let me tell you this. Paul highly valued the role of women in ministry. Uh, Lydia, Church of Philippi, the one that we're talking about right here, Lydia was the first Philippian believer that was converted, and Paul, she brought Paul and Silas into her home, and it was her home where the church at Philippi first met. Uh, in another of Paul's writings, he addresses Aquila and Priscilla, likely a husband and wife, and church met in their home. Uh, Paul highly valued the role of women in ministry, but it is his words that squash the hopes of many women who want to be pastors or serve in a larger teaching role in a church environment. Can I say this? You women are a vital part of the ministry of this church and every church. Amen. Without you this church could not do what it does. I praise God for the women that serve in this church. Someone can make all kinds of arguments for why women should have a larger role than they currently do in churches. Could make arguments about that it would be okay for a woman to be the pastor of this church. You can't right now because I'm you. I'm yours, so you know I'm going to be in there a long time. <laughs> But they can make all kinds, and arguments are made for the legitimacy in that type of situation. I want to ask you another question. Don't answer. I would say that in my class sometimes. I say, don't answer, don't answer, don't answer. And then when I ask the question, you know what somebody would do? Answer. Yeah. Don't answer. Is it okay for a woman to do a man's job in the church if there is no man to step up and do the job? No, it is not. I do not say that to belittle women. You know me by now. Okay? If anything, I, if anything, I say that to put a burr under the men of our church to step up and take a bigger role in ministry. I know that our church is, is largely composed of women. And I, again, I am so very thankful for that. But we need our men to be the spiritual leaders in our homes and the spiritual leaders in our church. We live in a world where the gender lines are getting blurrier and blurrier. Can I get an amen on that? What roles do men and women play in society? What roles in the church? Are there things that should be limited to do one gender as opposed to the other? But, believe it or not, I can't believe some of the statements that I'm hearing in, in, in people, out of people's mouths lately. 
They say things like, biology does not determine anything. Really? <laughs> does biology determine some of the roles you can and cannot have? I saw a Facebook post recently that, that put it in pretty clear terms. It said this, if you don't think gender matters, go buy a rooster for eggs and a bowl for milk. <laughs> You will soon learn that God knew exactly what he was doing. What about sports? Is it okay for a boy to play with dolls and a girl to referee professional football? You may have your opinion, and I might have mine, but we're not here today to discuss opinions. Yours is just as valid as mine. My only authority is this book. And the Bible says that men are to be the spiritual leaders in their homes, and in the church. I'm not trying to be politically correct here today, guys. See, I did it there. <laughs> if I were, then I would accept a person of either gender as having the right to pastor a church. And I would ignore what the Bible says on a host of issues. No, in mentioning these things, I'm trying to be humble. Humble enough to consider the other person's feelings and humble enough to submit to Scripture as best I understand it, even when I do not like what it says. <laughs> you say there's some things that the Bible says that you don't like? Yeah. I bet you found a few of them too. I also have to be humble enough to admit that regarding the verses dealing with women in ministry, my interpretation might be wrong. But until the day comes when I find out that I was wrong, I have a responsibility. As best I can through study and prayer, I have to come to a conclusion about each passage and live my life, my convictions based on that. For that, I will answer to God. And to loosely quote a famous theologian, unless someone can use scripture to convince me of a different interpretation, here I stand. I will not be swayed by popular opinion even when it would be pleasant to do so. When dealing with conflict, be loving, be direct, be focused, and be humble enough to receive help and listen to the counsel that others provide. Finally, very quickly, number five, when dealing with conflict, be memorable. Now by memorable, I don't mean that your fight should be memorable. <laughs> uh, one of the churches that I served at about a year after I came there, I found out that Two of the deacons, one night after a business meeting, had gone out in the parking lot and had a fist fight with each other. By the time that I got there, those deacons were gone, but everybody remembered their fight. Here in Philippians chapter 4, these two women, Paul was not calling these women to remember their fight. He was calling them to remember what they had once fought for. Go ahead and pull up that next one, Jim. Yodia Syndicate labored with me in the gospel with Clement Austin and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. By saying these words, Paul was reminding these women of something. He was reminding them that they had labored together in the gospel. And that word labored there, where is it? There we go. Labored with me in the gospel, okay? That word labored, it doesn't mean to work. It means to struggle. They had struggled in prayer. They had struggled with people as they were going through issues. They had struggled to find resources to be able to meet needs in other people's lives. Together with Paul and Clement and other unknown people here, they had struggled to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ. The fact is that some of the people that were there in the Philippian church were there because these women had led them to faith in Jesus Christ. These women who had once worked side by side were now standing back to back against each other. And Paul said, oh, that's so sad. The words that Jesus said to the Ephesian church in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 5 applied in these women's situation. Remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Paul said of Yodi and Syndicate that their names were in the book of life. They were Christians. 
and they were fighting with each other. What was true of them could be true of us. The church, this church, that I am privileged and humbled to pastor is not a boring church. There are many strong personalities in this church. Strong opinions that have grown out of your experiences and your history and all that you have gone with through together. And there's nothing wrong with that. Strong personalities, strong opinions, strong experiences. The only time that becomes a problem is when we allow it to divide us. I'm not asking you to like every person here. I'm asking you to love every person here. I'm asking you to work together for the kingdom. Do not... Paul called these women to serve together. Folks, when we get along with the other person and when our personalities mesh with the other person and, and, and we we able to work together because of that, you know what that doesn't require? That doesn't require any faith. It doesn't require any grace. But it's when we, with all our differences are able to set those aside so that we can cooperate together and work together for the kingdom, that's when we become a testament to the faith and grace of God to the world out there that needs to see that we're different. That our marriages are different. That our, that our church is different. That, that we live differently. If we're like them, why should they come in here? It's when we show that we are different. Let me enlighten you about something in your future. Paul mentions the book of life in this passage. You know whose name is written in the book of life? Every person who has a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if your name is written in the book of life, you're going to be with Jesus for eternity in heaven. Yay. Hallelujah. Do you know who else you're going to be with? whoever it is you've been fighting with. If they're a Christian and you're a Christian, you're going to be together forever. <laughs> so that's okay, because by then, I'll be like Jesus, and they'll be like Jesus, and all the rough edges will be gone, and, and there, Jesus said, no more plowshare, you know, be the swords and the plowshares, be no conflict then. Everything will be great then, so I can handle them then. Besides, their mansion might be a long way away from my mansion. Let me ask you a question. Why wait till then? Why wait? Why wait till then to become like Jesus and start acting like Jesus? Why wait till then to get issues resolved with other people? Why wait till then to start living like Jesus? Because if we really want to be about the gospel, then we need to live like Jesus. I saw a movie a long time ago. Uh, the name of the movie is Can't Buy Me Love. And uh, it stars a, a teenage Patrick Dempsey as a high school student. And he was part of the non-popular nerdy crowd. Well, he wanted to be part of the popular crowd. And so he, a situation was presented, which I won't go into, but he used all of his savings in order to rent the most popular girl in school for a certain period of time. His goal was, for as he entered into a fake relationship with her, that because she was popular, his popularity quotient would rise and he would become popular as well. It worked for a while until everybody found out that the relationship was a scam. He ended up being ostracized by everybody, his old friends, his new friends. He, by the end of the movie, he was more lonely than he'd ever been. One of the last scenes in the movie was where one of the popular kids was attacking one of the nerdy kids who was a, or an original friend of Patrick Dempsey's character. And Patrick Dempsey's character, he comes in with a baseball bat in his hand, violently confronts the situation. He doesn't hit the other guy. He you know, bangs on the table, get everybody's attention and stuff. And what he does is he reminds those two individuals that are so far apart at this point that they used to be the best of friends in elementary school. He reminds them of their past and where they had fallen from. 
the intervention works. This young man, he came in from the outside in order to pull these two back together, and the cliques that had driven this school apart faded into oblivion because somebody stepped in to bring the two groups back together. This morning, I'm asking you to do something similar in that situation. I'm asking you to do one or more combination of things I'm getting ready to mention very quickly here. First is this. Remember. Remember how far you were from Jesus Christ. Remember how your sins were and are offensive to Jesus Christ. Remember that he had no reason other than love to reach out to you. And yet he did. He did not allow his differences from you so vast to prevent him from entering into a relationship with you. And if that is true for you, then it is true of every other person in this room that has a relationship with Jesus you have far more in common with each other than there are things that can separate you. Remember. Secondly, I'm asking you this. Forgive and forget. You may have an issue with somebody in this room. You may have an issue with another family. You say, Chris, I don't have any issue with anybody in this room. Would you at least be humble enough to ask God's Spirit to examine your heart to make sure that that is true? And to make sure that there are no, under, no hard feelings, no undercurrent, nothing that would hold you from being in a relationship with another person. BBS is happening two weeks from tomorrow. Deneen is putting the people in places. Please tell me that you would not go to Deneen and say, Deneen, I really don't get along with that person. Please don't put me with that person. What a testimony, poor testimony, that would be of this church. Forget. Forget. Say, I can't forget. Then never bring it up ever again. Don't allow it to impact your relationship with that person. Let it go. If it's not worth it, if there's no way to properly resolve it, then let it go. Drop it. Let it be gone. Third thing I'm asking is this. Help. Help this church become the church that God wants it to be. Paul spoke of a true yoke fellow, a companion, an anonymous person. We don't know who that person is except to say this. He was someone who could help. He was someone who could help resolve the situation. And sometimes what a church needs is somebody who's on the outskirts to step up and take up a new level of involvement in the church in order to help that church be unified, in order to help that church come together. Are you willing to take a risk? Are you willing to up your level of involvement? Last week we sang another song. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Let me ask you this. Are you glad that you're a part of this family of God? Then let it be known by what you're willing to give up, by what you're willing to surrender. Corey's going to lead us in song in just a moment. That song is I Surrender All. Are you willing to do that? Your pride, your past, your agenda. Are you willing to surrender all for Jesus Christ and for this church? Let's pray together. Father, we bow before you right now. And we've come to your word here today. And it's confronted our hearts. It's confronted my heart. I pray, Father, Holy Spirit, search our hearts. See if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. I pray that we would be humble before you, but I pray more. I pray that we'd be humble before each other. And that we would listen before we make up our minds. The book of Proverbs says that the person who makes up his mind before he hears the whole matter is a fool. I don't want to be a fool. I want to be somebody you can be proud of. And I want that for this church as well. Direct us, Father. Empower us for your service. Help us to surrender to you. And I thank you 
Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.